you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to talk to you about how to take heart when you're falling apart. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. While you're finding your way there, it was a great week this last week. Uh, we On Friday, we began pouring concrete, the footings for the new building. I think we have a picture of uh, the cement going in. And uh, in the footing that is... Uh, at the basement level underneath the pulpit, we embedded a Bible into that footing and inside the cover. I think we have a photo of that on the next slide. Uh, on the, uh, in the footing, we embedded a Bible and inside the cover of the Bible, uh, there was Pastor Tate's very first sermon that he preached on Christmas Eve, 1983, when harvest time was six people strong, um, the first uh, meeting of our church, and then the first sermon that I preached in January of 1999 when I became the senior pastor. So so the Word of God is embedded into the foundation of our building. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to give you an opportunity um, to write scriptures and we're going to embed them right into the uh, foundation of the new building so you can start thinking about the scripture uh, that you're going to put and plant um, that seed of the Word that you're going to plant in the foundation of the building. Here's a good one for everyone who's believing on some members of your family. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your whole house. That's a good one. I'm going to to put that one in the foundation of the new building. <clears throat> Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's talk for a few minutes about how to take heart when you're falling apart. 2 Corinthians 4 beginning in verse 1. Paul says, therefore since through God's mercy we have received this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay so that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Jumping down to verse 16, just look at the first line of verse 16. Therefore, Paul says, we do not lose heart. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us this morning. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence. We feel you here with us this morning. And we thank you for your powerful word. Father, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I pray that you'd speak spirit and life to us. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. In Jesus' name. Have you ever been through a season in life when you had to choose to take heart? There was an aging man who received the terrible news that he needed a heart transplant. And he was put on the waiting list for a donor. A while later, he was summoned to the hospital for surgery. The surgeon came in and he said, Sir, this is highly unusual, but we have two hearts that are both matches for you. You have to choose to take one. One heart belonged to a 30-year-old man who was in top athletic condition. The other heart belonged to a man in his late 50s who was a lawyer for 30 years. Which one will you take? Without batting an eye, the patient said, I'll go with the lawyer. The surgery went textbook perfect. And when the patient was out of recovery, the surgeon stopped by to check on him. And he said, I'm curious. Why did you take the lawyer's heart 
instead of the young athlete. And the patient said, oh, that's easy, doc. I figured I should take the heart that had never been used. <laughs> My apologies to Pastor Nick. <laughs> he's practicing grace now, so he's been using his heart since 2003. <laughs> Have you ever had to choose to take heart? Have you ever had a season when you felt like you were falling apart? You took a serious hit. You suffered a setback, and it left you a little dazed. You received news that took the wind right out of your sails. And in spite of all hell breaking loose, you had to keep going. You had to find the courage to keep putting one foot in front of the other to muster the strength to press on. Paul was in a season of his life when everything was falling apart. Things were going badly at work. The fruit of all of his labors was in serious jeopardy. The churches that Paul planted and that he oversaw were all struggling in one way or another. Some of the churches were plagued with serious sin. Some of the churches were plagued with internal strife. And once that gets rooted into a church, it's almost impossible to kill. Some of the churches were plagued with interlopers teaching strange doctrine. Some of the churches were plagued with persecution so intense that Paul was afraid they were going to crack. Things were also going badly in Paul's relationships. His friends were forsaking him. Some lost their passion for the mission and turned back to the world. Some lost their passion for Paul and parted ways with him. Some even betrayed Paul. Paul's foes were pursuing him. There were false teachers constantly on his heels. And as soon as Paul would leave one city and go to the next, the false teachers would come in right behind him and smear his reputation. Jews and Romans were trying to kill Paul. And he was also struggling physically and emotionally. He was sick in his body and he was in pain, and he battled with anxiety that he says here in 2 Corinthians prevented him from ministering at times. Paul said, we are being squeezed. We are perplexed. We are harassed. We've taken a hit. And maybe somebody here this morning can relate to that. Maybe things are hard at work. Maybe things are hard at home. Maybe they're hard in your relationships. Maybe things are hard in your finances or in your health. Maybe you know what it feels like to be squeezed. You know what it feels like to be perplexed. Yet in the midst of all of it, Paul says twice here, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. If you still have your Bible open, I want you to look at verse 1 and then look at verse 16 and I want to learn you something this morning. What does it say in verse 1? It says in verse 1, therefore we do not lose heart. And then what does it say again in verse 16? Therefore we do not lose heart. In Bible study, this is called an inclusio. There's your theological word for the morning. An inclusio is like a sandwich, if you will. Verses 1, that's making me hungry right there. Verses 1 and verse 16, they are like the two pieces of bread in the sandwich. Therefore, we do not take heart. Therefore, we do not take heart. And what comes in between is the meat. It tells us why and how we don't lose heart. So looking at Paul's words here in 2 Corinthians 4, I find three resources that enable us to take heart when we're falling apart. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. How to take heart when you're falling apart. Three resources. First of all, take heart by his call to mercy. The first resource that helps us to take heart is the recollection that God has called us to be the recipients of his mercy. Paul says, since through God's mercy we have received this ministry call, we don't lose heart. Once again, Paul is remembering back to his encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus road. 
And Paul can't stop marveling at how God chose him, of all people, to become a recipient of mercy. He wrote to Timothy, I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, the worst of sinners, but I was shown mercy. God did that so that in, the, in me, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience and encourage others to put their trust in him. And what Paul wrote about himself is true too for every one of us who have been born again today. In our own way, each one of us was just like Saul of Tarsus, rebellious, defiant, turning away from God. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But in one extraordinary moment of divine grace, God called us to become a recipient of his mercy. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we all deserved God's wrath, but God, who is rich in mercy, he saved us. Let me tell you something. There's a thought that even on your worst day ought to make you shout hallelujah. Even as an old man, John still couldn't get over it. Even after a lifetime of following Jesus, he was still overcome by the thought of it all, that he should receive mercy. What kind of love is this, he wrote, that the Father has given to us that we, from among all people, should be called the sons of God. God has called us to mercy, and mercy has changed everything. Because of God's mercy, we now see differently than the rest. Paul says here in these verses that those who don't believe in Jesus can't believe in Jesus. He says they are spiritually blind. The God of this age, that is Satan, holds an influence over their minds that prevents them from recognizing that the gospel is true. Paul says there is a spiritual veil of unbelief over their heart that, presents, that prevents them from receiving and believing the message of Jesus. But God in his mercy has removed these conditions from us. And we now see everything with a new spiritual point of view. We see the whole point of life on earth differently now. We see our individual purpose in life differently now. We see our human frailty differently now. We realize that we are just clay pots. We even see our hardships differently now. And that helps us to take heart. God has called us to mercy and mercy has changed everything. Because of God's mercy we now live differently than the rest. Paul says, because of mercy, we now live in the sight of God. Mercy has changed three things. It has changed our motives, it has changed our message, and it has changed our methods. Our motive is no longer self-promotion. Our motive is no longer self-preservation. Our motive is no longer self-satisfaction. Our motive is neither fame nor fortune nor personal fulfillment. Our motive now is to be Christ's love slave for the sake of others. Not only has our motive changed, our message has changed. It's no longer about ourselves, but it's about Jesus Christ as Lord. And our methods have changed. Our methods are not cunning and deceitful. They're not distortion of the truth for personal gain. Our methods are openness and honesty and forthright speech. Our mercy changed lives have helped us to take heart during hardships because the goal of life has changed for us and the game plan is completely different now. God has called us to receive mercy and mercy has changed everything. We see differently, we live differently, and because God has called us to receive mercy, we can call on God for mercy whenever we need it. Paul says, since God has shown us mercy, we don't lose heart when we're falling apart. Now, beloved, listen to me. Here is how the recollection of God's mercy becomes a resource that helps you to take heart. God did not start showing you mercy back then only to stop showing you mercy now. Amen. 
If God called you back then to be a recipient of his mercy, then you are called to receive mercy all the way home. This is good preaching right near. You see, the, the call to mercy that we've received is the call to enter into the new covenant. We've been talking about the new covenant for a week or two. And in the new covenant, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, I will never stop doing good to them. The writer of Hebrews said that in this new covenant, we can approach him boldly, anticipating that we will find mercy to help us in our time of need. No wonder David cried out, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Listen, if you're squeezed right now, if you're confused, if you're harassed, if you've taken a hit, mercy is a resource that can help you to take heart. The God who called you to mercy when you were blinded by the God of this age, he will still be merciful to you. The God who called you to mercy when there was a thick veil of unbelief over your heart, he will still be merciful to you. The God who called you to mercy when you were self-centered, self-promoting, self-seeking, he will still be merciful to you. The God who called you to mercy when you were stubborn and rebellious and when you were lost in sin, going your own way, that God will still be merciful to you. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have received this ministry, we don't lose heart. How to take heart when you're falling apart? Three resources. Take heart by his call to mercy. And second, take heart by his recreating word. This is the second resource that take, helps us to take heart. It's God's word that continually recreates us. Paul goes on remembering his call on the Damascus Road. And he says that that moment that God called him was a moment of recreation. God who said in the beginning, let there be light, made his light shine into our hearts. You see, that moment of salvation, that moment when we receive Christ by faith, it's a moment when God speaks a word of recreation over us. In chapter 5, verse 17, we haven't gotten to 5 yet. Pastor Nick's going to take you there next week, but let me steal a little thunder at least. Paul says in chapter 5, verse 17, Behold, look, mira, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. Now listen, in our English Bible, it says if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation, but that's not what Paul wrote. Paul wrote, if anyone be in Christ, new creation. In other words, in that moment when we enter into Christ by faith, God speaks over us new creation. In the first creation, men were made in the image of God, but in the new creation, men are remade in the image of God in Christ. Into the clay pot of our humanity, God deposits the incomparable treasure of his glorious presence. And just as the mercy we've received means that we can anticipate mercy all the way home, so God's recreating word keeps on recreating us whenever we're falling apart. In verse 13, Paul quotes one of the key verses from a psalm of David. Psalm 116, listen, this is for someone in this house this morning. Listen, receive God's word this morning. In Psalm 116, David almost died. He said, the, door, the cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. When I was at my weakest, in my moment of greatest need, he rescued me. I believed in him. Therefore, I spoke to him about my affliction and he saved me. And Paul quotes that key verse from Psalm 116 here in 2 Corinthians 4.13. And he says, as it is written, I believed and therefore I spoke to God. He says, with that same spirit of faith, we believe and so speak to God. 
In other words, with that same spirit of faith that David cried out to God on his deathbed, we cry out to God in the midst of our suffering, firmly believing that the God who delivered David will deliver us too. So here's how this thing works. God has spoken over us his word of recreation, new creation. And whenever we're falling apart, we speak to God with that spirit of faith of David, with that spirit of faith of Paul, I believe you, God. And God replies to us, new creation. And so we experience his recreation in the midst of our trial. We might be squeezed. Anybody a little squeezed right now? We might be squeezed, but with the spirit of faith of David, with the spirit of faith of Paul, we speak to God, I believe in you, and God replies to us, new creation. And so we are recreated in the midst of the squeezing, and therefore we are not squashed. We might be confused by what has happened to us by what has happened to people that we love. But with the spirit of faith of David, with the spirit of faith of Paul, we speak to God, I believe you, God. And God replies, new creation. And so we are recreated in the midst of our confusion, and therefore we are not confounded. We might be harassed, but with the spirit of faith, we speak to God, I believe in you. And God replies, new creation. And so we are recreated in the midst of the persecution and therefore not abandoned. We might be knocked down, but with the spirit of faith of David, with the spirit of faith of Paul, we cry out, God, I believe in you. And God replies, new creation. And so we are recreated in the midst of getting knocked around and therefore we are not knocked out. Yeah. And all of these sufferings, we identify intimately with the dying pains of Jesus, but in the midst of it, his life is manifest in us, and so we are recreated. I once heard a very interesting thought about Napoleon Bonaparte, who almost conquered the world. The writer said, Napoleon had the magic touch for victory, but he had no strategy for defeat. He didn't know how to deal with defeat. He didn't know how to bounce back from defeat. He had no grid for it. He had no grace for it. But you know, we are not like Napoleon. We have a strategy to deal with defeat. We have a strategy to bounce back from defeat. God has spoken over us his word, new creation. And every time we call on him in the midst of trouble, he recreates us again and he gives us the strength to endure. Squeezed hard, but not squashed. Mighty confused, but not confounded. Harassed, but not abandoned. Knocked down, but not knocked out. Always experiencing the dying pains of Jesus, but always experiencing his renewing of life. Amen. How to take heart when you're falling apart, three resources. Take heart by his call to mercy. Take heart by his recreating word. And finally, take heart by his resurrection power. Worship team, you can come and help me. The first resource that helps us take heart is recalling his mercy, calling for mercy. The second resource that helps us take heart is God's recreating word. The final resource that helps us take heart is his resurrection power. Paul says here, with that same spirit of faith, we believe and we so speak to God because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us also. You know, the resurrection reminds us that the entire experience of our Christian life is a God-ordained process that has a glorious conclusion. The dying pains of Jesus, the death of Jesus, it led to his glorious resurrection. And the dying pains of Jesus that we experience, they lead to his glorious resurrection power being released inside of us. Now, I have something good this morning for everyone who has ever asked God the question, why? 
God, why did you let me go through such a terrible time? God, why did you allow me to go through so much stress at work? Why did you allow that person to get ahead by smearing me? God, why did you allow me to suffer that financial setback? God, why did you allow the person who loved me to betray me? I have to tell you, after 25 years in ministry, I thought that I was unshockable. But I have sat with people who have experienced betrayal so cruel that I never would have thought possible. God, why? Why did you allow me to get sick? Forget about me. Why did you allow my child to get sick? God, take me. Just spare my child. How many people have ever asked God why? Come on. I have the answer to your question. Amen. I have the answer for every why that you have ever asked God. You want to know what it is? God's answer to your why is so that God has hidden his treasure in our jars of clay. Why? So that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Why does God allow us to be squeezed? It is so that his resurrection power can rise up inside of us and save us from being squashed. Why does God allow us to be confused? It is so that his resurrection power can rise up inside of us and save us from being confounded. Why does he allow us to be harassed? It is so that his resurrection power can rise up inside of us and save us from being abandoned. Why does he allow us to be knocked down? It is so that his resurrection power can rise inside of us. Why does he allow us to experience the dying pains of Jesus? It is so that the power of his resurrection life can be manifest in us. Beloved, listen, God has an ultimate purpose to this process of our suffering and then experiencing his recreating, renewing resurrection power. Why does God allow it? So that, first of all, his resurrection power will change our inner nature day by day. Listen, Paul says something happens. Something happens inside of us as we keep on experiencing hardships, passing through them, and in the midst of them experiencing his recreating, renewing, resurrection power. He says something happens inside of us. He says our inner nature, it gets stronger and stronger. He says that we're getting heavier and heavier with God's presence. Yeah, I notice you're putting on a little weight. But it's a good thing. We're getting heavier and heavier with his presence. Therefore, our hardships, he says, are getting lighter and lighter. Now listen, that doesn't mean that they're any less serious. But it means that we're able to handle them better. My oldest sister, Laurie, is almost six years older than me. Actually, my birthday is September 8th. I was born on her first day of kindergarten. And so, since my mother was in the hospital giving birth to me and my father was there with her on her first day of school, my grandparents had to take her to school. And she never forgot it and she never forgave me for it. <laughs> so for years, I was her punching bag. She squeezed me. She confused me. She harassed me. She knocked me down, literally. Actually, she used to pin me down to the ground with all of her weight. But you know, as the years rolled on and nature took its course, something strange started to happen. I started getting bigger. I started getting taller. My muscles started getting heavier. My sister, she's only 5'2". I'm 5'11". And I'll never forget the day finally came that she was picking on me and I just reached out with both arms and I picked her right up off the ground. It shocked both of us. Now she hadn't changed. She was the same size, only 5'2". She's the same size she had been since she was nine. 
But I had grown bigger. I had grown heavier. I had grown stronger. So now I was able to handle her. And that's precisely the way it is with God's resurrection power inside of you. Listen to me. The more hardships we endure, the more his power is released in us. And the more his power is released in us, the heavier we become in his presence. And the heavier we become with his presence, the lighter our troubles become. Not that they're any less serious, but we are able to handle them well better. And you know, that was the last day that she ever picked on me. And that reminds me of another truth. Not only does the resurrection make our troubles light, but it makes, them, it makes them temporary, Paul says. My present afflictions, they will not outlive my present life. They belong to this present age, but I belong to the future age. These afflictions, they will end. They will not have the last word on my life. The same good father who would not abandon Jesus in the grave, he will not abandon in me either. In him we trust. He has delivered us. He is delivering us. In him we put our hope that he will always deliver us. God has an ultimate purpose in this process of our suffering and then experiencing his power. Why does God allow it? So that second his resurrection power on display in us will lead more and more people to his saving grace. Paul says something happens when we suffer and when we overcome. There's a signal that goes out from our life. It's God's grace. And, and it touches people. It reaches them. It causes them to turn and give thanks to God. Do you know people are watching you? Family members are watching you. Friends are watching you. Co-workers, they're watching you. They know you belong to Jesus. And they're watching you get squeezed. In fact, they like watching you get squeezed a little bit. But you know what? They're watching to see what happens. And they don't know how it is that you are squeezed and yet you are never squashed. They don't know how it is that you're confused, but you're never confounded. They don't know how it is that you keep getting knocked down, but you're not knocked out. You just won't stay down. They want to know how it is that you keep on taking heart. They want to know how it is that you remain peaceful. They want to know how it is that you remain joyful. They are drawn to the grace on display in you. Didn't we see that recently? with the families of the nine believers that were killed at the AME church in Charleston. Those family members, believers in Christ, one by one, they looked into the face of the man who killed their loved ones and they forgave him. They said, we're praying for you. They pleaded with him to surrender his life to Christ. They said, we forgive you. Now give your heart to Jesus. Let him save your life. And look at what a difference it made in their city. Rather than standing on the roof of a police cruiser screaming, burn this city down. Look at it, the difference that grace made. God has an ultimate purpose in this process of our suffering and then experiencing his power. Why does God allow it? Finally, this, so that his resurrection power inside of us will minister to others. Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, all of this is for your benefit. This whole process that we've been through of suffering and then experiencing his recreating, his renewing, his resurrection power. He says, everything I've been through, it is for your benefit. This death of Jesus that I've experienced, it means life for you. Certainly, as we suffer and as we experience his power, it gives an example that is an encouragement. But there's something even better than that. Do you know his resurrection power that is manifest in us as we suffer? It becomes a reservoir from which we can minister to others. In the opening lines of 2 Corinthians, Paul says it this way. 
He says this same comfort that we ourselves have received in suffering, it is now the reservoir from which we minister to you. You see, that strength that I received from him while I was being squeezed, that strength has left a reservoir of strength inside of me, and now I'm going to give a little bit of it to you. That comfort that I received while I was confused, while I was heartbroken, while I didn't know what to think, that comfort I received, it has left inside of me a reservoir of comfort. And now I'm going to give a little bit of that to you. That healing that I received when I was sick, it has left within me a reservoir of healing. And now I'm going to give a little bit of it to you. That deliverance that I've received, there's a reservoir of deliverance in me. That resurrection life that I've received, it's a reservoir. Now I'm going to give a little bit to you. Therefore, since by God's mercy we have received this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have this treasure hidden in jars of clay so that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are squeezed hard, but not squashed. We are confused, but not confounded. We are harassed, but never abandoned. We are knocked down, but not knocked out. Always experiencing the dying pains of Jesus so that we might experience his resurrection life inside of us. Therefore, we do not lose heart, for our light and temporary troubles are achieving for us a far greater weight of glory as we fix our eyes on what is unseen. How to take heart when you're falling apart, three resources. Take heart by his mercy. Take heart by his recreating word. Take heart by his resurrection power. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place this morning.